Good morning. Today we will be talking about the topic called self-supervised learning. The previous few lectures have been focusing on when we want to make predictions for a new task for which we don't have a lot of data. We have looked into Bayesian hierarchical models where we were trying to predict the lung function of a person given their progression of, of certain diseases over week. Then we also looked at how we can use meta learning for solving similar such problems. So we looked at uh, hyper networks and we also looked at neural processes inspired architectures. We have not yet looked at the processes part of neural process. We have mainly looked at the encoder decoder way. So the in meta learning, what we were basically trying to do was given some context available from a new task at hand, what can we do to be able to predict well for that specific task? Today we will be looking at self-supervised learning and in the next few lectures we will be looking at active learning. All of these problems, all of these solutions are uh, can be applied to problems where we don't have a lot of data from a target task at hand. I will be referring to a couple of nice resources. The first are the set of slides from the University of Amsterdam deep learning course. The second is a blog on self-supervised learning. So these are good resources. So we have often heard about the trinity of machine learning, deep learning, which has led to the success of deep learning. And we have looked at the algorithms such as gradient descent, the optimization algorithm and their variants. We have looked at model classes, the sophistications, the improvements to models which have been made. For example, in the mid 2010s or the early 2010s, they were we were we looked into various new architectures such as residual connections which we look today we also looked at various kinds of new activations which all made the models better more recently there have been a surge of models like the transformer models the other reason behind a lot of progress in machine learning community has been the better availability of gpus and the third which is quite important is the availability of high quality data sets so if you remember in the last semester's course, in the machine learning course, we had discussed about the story of the ImageNet challenge. How prior to the ImageNet challenge, a lot of the community was focused on just using classic computer vision like methods or uh, where they were trying to focus on getting just a few images labeled correctly. Whereas the researchers, the team behind ImageNet, they said that data is the missing link at that point and they released this ImageNet challenge and the data set. So that's where all three of them have been working together. Like we require all three components in order to make significant progress towards machine learning. Now, when we talk about data and we talk about ImageNet like challenges, the difficulty in obtaining such data is because we want to get the labels. So when we're thinking in terms of the supervised learning task, now there can be various kinds of tasks. There could be tasks such as segmentation. There could be tasks such as classification, object detection, etc. All of them require varying amounts of sophistication in terms of the labeling cost. As an example, just telling if there is a bird or not, that's a classification task. That can be in that can be a comparatively easier task to label, to get a label for. In comparison to, let's say, if you were to tell the number of such birds or for example the number of these wild animals or if you were to do a segmentation where you want to separate out the grass from the animals or let's say you want to do such bounding boxes you want to put, pick so there are these different kinds of tasks where manual annotation can be fairly expensive and they are telling this example of it can also take up to 30 minutes per image and it requires human expertise so therefore we are often limited by the amount of data we can get labeled. So in such situations, what this, this idea of self-supervised learning is suggesting is that there still seems to exist a lot of images in the wild. Right? So I may not know the labels of all of these images, right? but can I still make use of those images? And that's where the term self-supervision comes into play. The broad idea would be in a supervised learning framework, we would be given certain images which 
are bottlenecked by the human giving the labels as cats, dogs, and for a simple classification problem, then we will be learning the representation and then we can transfer the or fine tune these representations on any target data set. In contrast, in self supervised learning, what we're saying is that let's remove the bottleneck, which is the human annotation, which or the any other way of annotation. So for, for image like task, we are looking into the human annotation where a human expert will look into this. For other tasks where we are looking for some sensory data, some sensor data, there the installation of the sensor provides you the ground truth in various cases. So there also there is a additional cost required to obtain the ground truth or the labels. So in, in, in contrast, what self-supervised learning says is that you pick up these images and you create some pre-training tasks or some task for which you can automatically figure out the labels, right? Which you do not need a human to label, like you transform the data in such a way so that you know the exact transformation applied and then you're trying to predict that specific transformation. And that can help you to learn a representation which then you can fine tune on the limited amount of data that you have from the target task at hand. So we will be looking at a few kinds of self-supervised methods. I will be quickly showing the one which we have used in our current notebook today. And then we'll go back into the details of it and see what we're doing. So we have such images in the data set, which are currently unlabeled, right? We can have millions of such images, like we're not bounded by anything. We have millions of images on the internet. What we're saying is that let's take this image, let's create different rotations of this image, 0, 90, 180, 270. And then we create, we learn a model which takes in the original image and predicts the angle by which it is rotated. Now this becomes a self-supervised task because you don't require any human supervision. You do not require any human annotation. You can directly provide the labels based on the transformation that you've applied. Now, when we train a model on this task, what we're saying is that we'll be able to learn a reasonably good featureization of a uh, given an image to, to create those features. And then we are just hoping that we'll be able to quickly fine tune those features for the new target task at hand. So often the target task at hand is often called the downstream task. So the downstream task could be, let's say classification or it could be segmentation or object detection, etc. So this is one such kind of transformation based self supervised task, but there could be many other tasks. And now let's go back to the notebook and let's go over the entire code and see how we'll go about such a task. So I'll be using the CIFAR 10 data set for this task. CIFAR 10 data set, as you may know, contains images of the size 32 cross 32 and these are three channel images. They have about six, they have 60,000 images and 10 such classes, airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, dog, frog, horse, ship, truck. We can visualize some of these images. So they, as you can notice, because they have quite low resolution, you'll not be able to very clearly see the object, but it's more or less visible. Like this is a frog truck, etc. We will be doing the standard data set division, but here we will be also looking at not just the train and test division. We will be dividing the data set into three sets. The first called the train, the last being the test, which is unseen to us. For the train, we have the labels also. For the test, we only know the inputs or we will get to know the inputs when we want to make the prediction. But at this point of time, we don't even know the input X and therefore we don't know the output Y or the label Y. But there is the other set called the pool set. Now this terminology, the pool set I'm picking up from the active learning literature. So I'll be looking at the pool set as a set whose inputs I know. So these are, let's say some images I've been able to obtain via the internet. I don't know the labels, but this is different from the test set, which is unseen to me at this point of time. 
So I will be looking at a small number of train images. I'll be using 1000 images to train my network, 20,000 images overall, which I'll test my network. And then there are 39,000 images, which I know the inputs, I know the, I've seen the image, but I have not seen the, the labels. I don't know anything about the label. I will be using a ResNet classifier. So this is again coming from our library Astra. We have just made some wrapper around it to make it convenient to load ResNet. Now if we look at the model, so we have specifically created a model in a way that we have the classifier as separate as a separate nn dot module and then we have the featureizer as a separate nn dot module the benefit of the benefit of this is so let's say when we want to deal with a 10 class problem or a 30 class problem or a 4 class problem whatever we can pretty much use the same featureizer and we can just change the classifier part or we can also, if you're trying to solve a regression problem, we can still reutilize the featureizer part and we just need to change the regressor part. So part of the network will remain fixed through this specific kind of architecture that uh, is very commonly used. So we have specified that it's a 10 class problem. We'll be training on the, on the CIFAR 10 dataset, which is 10 classes. So this is the model specification. It seems like a fairly sophisticated model at this point. You can see that it contains some conf, batch norm, activation, max pool. And then there seems to be a sequential of something known as a basic block, which seems to be repeated. And then finally, we have the classifier part, which also has a dropout. The other way to look at such models is to use the TOS summary module or the TOT summary Python package. So this is showing the different layers and the outputs you get after this specific layer has been applied. So we can initially see that there are a lot of con, relus, batch norm, uh, quite a lot of layers. And this is where the linear or the classifier part comes into play, where we go from 512 to 10, eventually 10. So this model contains 11 million around 500,000 parameters. And another nice way to visualize such things is through a web application called Netron. So I've just, let me show you the code again. This code exports the model to something known as ONNX, which is a common, we can think of it as an interchange format across different deep learning frameworks and then we are passing it so we can see this specifically i wanted to show this to show what the residual connection is i'll not be going into the detail because that is better left to a machine learning or a deep learning course but essentially what we can see is that once we give the input 1 cross 3 cross 32 comma 32 we apply a conf layer we apply an activation we apply the pooling and then we seem to have two paths the first path, we again apply a conf layer, a relu, another conf, but the output, which is the activation from the, after the max pool is applied, it's added to the other path. And then we again apply the activation. And this kind of a connection is known as the skip connection or the residual connection. So it's providing an alternate path. If you want to back propagate, so this is the entire network. When we back pop propagate, we will then have two paths for which we can update the weights of this uh, conv layer. And we can see that these are the two paths. So it's, it's been shown to be, the resonant connections have been shown to be very effective in the literature. And finally, we have the, the res the MLP part, which will do the 10 class classification. If we come back to the code, so I've written a function which will predict, it will show me the accuracy of the model. I specifically written this function before I've done any prediction, because before I've done any training, because I want to see that how good is my model when I have not trained it. Right? By 
if by chance the weight initialization itself gives me good accuracy then it, we have lesser room to improve so the train accuracy is 7% for some reason most of the examples are being predicted to be the automobile class the pool so in all these classes in all these uh, train pool and test sets we are predicting the automobile class majority but the important thing is that the train test pool accuracy is very poor at this point they are less than 10% where we have 10 classes another thing we are doing is to visualize the embeddings that we are learning through the featureizer right so if you remember the featureizer that we had in our model so this featureizer creates a 5 and 2 dimensional vector feature corresponding to every image and that 5 and 2 dimensional vector is then passed on to the classifier through multiple layers uh, multiple fully connected layers and then we uh, get 10 outputs so the 5 and 2 dimensional vector which we get we can then pass it to any dimensionality reduction technique such as pca tsne or umap i have specifically use umap in this notebook because uh, presently it was working much quicker for me compared to tsne for some reason so then i used this and i'm showing the embeddings which i obtained for a model which is yet untrained and you can see that the different classes are all very cluttered together there is no as such structure which has appeared thus far from the embeddings after this we can train the model on the training dataset and if we look at the loss it seems to be converging if we plot the confusion matrix and the accuracies for the different sets so we have clearly been able to do 100% very well on the training data set on the pool set it's 36% on the test set is 36% so it's substantially better than now what we had with the untrained model where it was about 7% 8% so this is good that at least we been able to improve by 30% these numbers are still nowhere good in in terms of what we have seen so if you want to see cfr 10 leaderboard and here we can see some fairly top models where they getting 99.9% accuracy so we are quite we are using a very simple model at this point of time the other thing is that the data set that we have used is also quite small at this point so with such a small like we have only trained on a thousand such images but we have a lot more available images so the quality of prediction will improve if we train on more examples and now if we visualize the embeddings over the trained data set post training we can see very clear structures have appeared so it's therefore we get 100% accuracy on the training data set because uh, we have been able to create the features in such a way that the training examples can perfectly be separated out contrast this with the umap we got on the untrained model but showing it on the training data set is not the embeddings on the training data set is not enough you want to be able to see how what they look like on the test data set and if they work well here then we should have got a very high accuracy which we don't get we can clearly see that there is some structure which is still appearing we can see the automobiles are seem to be seem to be some set of clusters but it's still not very good therefore we're not able to get very high accuracy or i mean so because we're not getting high accuracy the feature is the features are not yet general enough for the entire test data set now we'll take a hypothetical scenario the pool set for which i've said that we had the inputs available but we don't have the labels yet but let's imagine that we had the labels available for them so in this case now we have a much bigger data set what will happen if we train on a larger data set likely the performance will improve so let's see what happens when we train on a train plus the pool data set we are training for 30 epochs
we can see that the losses have gone down. Now, if we look at the embeddings over the train set, they are again quite well separated out. There's some bit of ambiguity. Let's look at over the test set to see if the embeddings seem to be doing. So we can see that they seem to be much better now compared to the embeddings we had on the test set for the model which was just trained on the train data set. So the model which is trained on train plus pool clearly is having better embeddings it seems. But we should also be looking at the accuracy numbers and the confusion matrices. The train accuracy is 99.1%, the pool accuracy is 99.5% because it has seen the pool and the train, the accuracies on both these sets have to be high. On the test set, it seems to be 61.65%, which is now a fairly good number right, compared to where we started off. So increasing the data set is clearly improving the performance. But we also have to consider that we have now labeled or we have got access to 29,000 additional labeled images. Right? If each labeled image takes you a minute to label, so you have now spent 29,000 more minutes labeling. In this case, it's led to a significant increase in the performance, but we also have to factor in the amount of time it might have taken to label those images. And not just one person, maybe multiple people are labeling, and then we are looking at how consistent their predictions are or their labelings are. We will be now looking at self-supervised learning. I will take you back to the blog which I shared. So this is our task, initial task over which we will create our self-supervised model. Right? Uh, again, we will be looking at the train and the pool data set for which we know the X we know the input features. We can transform every image from them into rotated by 0, 90, 180, 270. And then we want a model to be able to predict by how much has this particular image been rotated. So we'll have to create a separate data set for this self-supervised learning task. We first create the train plus pool data set for both the X and Y. And we can see that the sizes of these are Sorry, the, I think the pool set is not 29,000, but rather 39,000. Right, so the train size is 1,000, the pool is 39,000. So by addition of 39,000 images to the 1,000 images, our test accuracy went from about 30 odd to about 60 odd. And for the self-supervised task, we can start with this 40,000 images and for each angle 0, 90, 180, 270, we will rotate this image using transforms.functional.rotate. There are many ways to do this and we'll store the angle by which a particular image has been rotated. So now for this new task at hand, our data set will become four times the original data set because each image has been rotated either 0, uh, so each image has been rotated 0, 90, 180 and 270 degrees and we can confirm this that the size of our data set is 160,000 images of size 3, 32, 32 and my labels is of size 160,000. So now this is a very large data set available for this specific task at hand. We can also confirm that the images are indeed correctly rotated or not. So I look at a particular image and I can see that it's been rotated 0 degree, 90 degree, 180 degree, which is, so you can see that these are flipped. And this is 270 degrees. I, so previously when I was writing this code, we were looking into writing with dot permute, but I thought to here show another way in which we can use Einstein summation or Einstein notation. So which I feel is slightly better or it's easier to, to show convey what we're doing over a notebook. So this is dimensionality corresponding to the number of channels, the height and the width. We are transforming it to height width channel because that is what matplotlib wants to use as, a, as an image for plotting. After this, for this specific task at hand, I create another ResNet. So that is the advantage of the code that we had written. 
in the tool in the toolkit so we can again now invoke another resnet classifier the featureizer part we will be reusing later but the only thing we can now change we can directly change is that this is a four class classification problem we need to predict the angle and if we so i'll just skip over the part where i'm training this and i can show that the loss is converged so we can run it for a few more iterations but it's more or less converged we can look at the embeddings on the train data set so these are the embeddings we have obtained via the ssl task by the pre training task or via the task for predicting the angles so here the embeddings don't look very good at this point of time but we'll see that if we just uh if we just fine tune these embeddings over the downstream task which is the classification task we will improve them quite significantly very quickly so this is the main idea now we use a resnet classifier so now we come on to the downstream task classifier we create a resnet classify model with 10 classes because our original downstream task is a 10 class classification but we will be reusing the featureizer from the ssl task so we have the ssl angle task which has a featureizer whose parameters are stored in the state dict we load that into the featureizer for the new downstream task so it's fairly similar to the way transfer learning is being done but here the transfer learning or the the way we have shifted the or we have reusing the featureizer is through a different pretext task so there in transfer learning typically you would have trained the 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 previous model or the pre trained model is what we call on let's say the similar kind of a task but here we uh, let's say we have trained it but maybe on a different data set uh, so let's say you wanted to predict cats versus dogs but you picked up a pre trained vgg which has been also trained on image like classification task but on a much larger data set so you fine tune that on your specific data set here the pre training task could be is the self supervised learning task in which in our specific case it was predicting the angle so it's pretty similar except for the task at hand but the important thing here is that in our pre training task we didn't require any labels we just took the image and converted or did various kinds of transformation so that we know the labels so through all of this what we are hoping is that when we when we learn a network which can predict the angles by which an image has been rotated it's able to somehow learn the structure right so that is the main intuition so that's how we are trying to create various kinds of self supervised learning task so that by doing such things we are able to somehow learn the structure uh, which is present in the image or the relationships between different kinds of objects which are available in the image and then they can be passed on to the downstream task where these can be quickly fine tuned adjusted so that we can get good amount of accuracy or performance in a relatively small amount of iterations and relatively small number of images available from the downstream task now if we train this specific model where we are only uh, where we have loaded the weights and then we will be only fine tuning all the weights in this network for the classification task and we can see that the training loss has quickly converged we can look at the embeddings over the train data set as well as over the test data set and over the test data set also you can see that it's significantly better compared to when we had trained only using the training data let's look at the accuracy numbers also so as expected the accuracy over the training set is 100% over the pool is 35 over the test is also 35 okay this seems to be something which has not worked out correctly 
let's go back and run the entire notebook and ensure that we have not missed out any important step. So let's look at the numbers we have obtained till now for the different kinds of models. When we had an untrained model, the accuracy number on the test set was about 9%. When we had trained only on the trained data set, the test performance was about 36%. When we had trained on the train plus pool, the pool set is quite a big data set. We will be looking into application scenarios where we don't have access to that. There's the test accuracy was 62%. And now we looked at the SSL task, which we are currently tuning. So if we look at the training loss over the SSL task, it seems to have converged. We will then create a new network for classification where we will uh, where we will load in the features from the self supervised learning task and we will plot the losses over time they seem to have converged we look at the embeddings over the train set and they're quite quite well separated out. Over the test set, we can see some structures available. Again, they're not super clear. Let's look at the performance over the test set. All right, so previously maybe I had not run some specific cell. The test set performance is now 48%, right? So if you were to summarize the numbers in some kind of a table, so let's see. summary of the test set performance and let me if we had <coughs> train on thousand lamp uh, labeled images we got about okay untrained model was about nine percent train on thousand samples was about 30 30 odd percent something like that 36 percent thirty six percent so this is the train set train on thousand plus thirty nine thousand label samples from the pool we got 62 something like that 62 percent and then train on ssl task whatever number of images we plus then fine tune on thousand labeled labeled samples we get about 47 percent right so if we look at these numbers, we can clearly see that here for the SSL task, for for this record, this record, and this record, we have only looked at the thousand images. Like we have access to only thousand label images. So our performance can go up from thirty six percent to forty seven percent via the SSL task. Of course, if we had access to the labeled examples, that would also improve the performance. But this was just to show how much you can improve by the pre-training task via SSL. So we have looked at one such task, which was a geometric transformation task. 
there are quite a lot of other tasks which have been covered in this blog post. I will quickly cover over some of them and then leave the remaining for you to look into. So we can start with RGB images and we can manually convert or, or through code, through known transforms, convert them into grayscale. And then we can have the pre-training task as given a grayscale image to predict the, to predict the actual RGB image. We can have image super resolution based tasks. We can also have image in painting based tasks. So we randomly take away or in some structured way, we take away some patches from the image, which we consider to be missing. And then we're trying to reconstruct those. So through this, again, we're trying to hope we were hoping that we'll be able to recover some kind of a structure available in the image in the self supervised task, which we can then leverage for the further downstream tasks. Uh, this particular paper or method is called the cross channel prediction. We can take an input image, we can convert them into two different color encodings or two different color kind of channels. The one is the grayscale one and the other is the AB color channels. Now you take from the input, you convert them into these two known. This is a deterministic method now, deterministic transform. Now, given this grayscale image, you want to predict the color channels. Given the color channels, you want to predict the grayscale image, and then you can combine them. And then you can look at the reconstruction loss between the predicted and the input image. And through that, you can improve the featureization coming from the grayscale and the colored images. Now, when you're trying to overall construct the featureizer, that could perhaps be the concatenation of the featureization from the two separate networks that we have. There can be a lot of permutations and combinations here. Another interesting kind of a task, pre-training task that we can use is the image jigsaw based thing. Uh, so let's say that we divide our image into patches, into nine patches, right? So we can now randomly reshuffle or we can shuffle these patches and then our task is to tell what specific permutation this is. So if we have nine patches, so we can call this the top left, top middle, top right, and this is middle left, middle, middle, middle right, and then bottom left, bottom middle, and bottom right. So we have nine patches. For the first position, we have nine uh, possible, possible patches which we could have fixed. For the second one, eight, for this seven. So total we have nine factorial possible such combinations. Uh, we typically pick up a small subset of this. For example, 64 they have shown. So given such a transform permutation you, where the patches have been moved around, you the task is to predict where or what specific permutation is that. So this is again a K class classification problem where K is the number of permutations you have chosen. There are other varieties such as geometric transformation, image clustering, and others which I will skip for now. But this was just to give you a glimpse into the possibilities of self-supervised learning or the importance of pre-training or what we can leverage from unlabeled data. If you have access to a large amount of labeled data, that can turn out to be more useful than just having labeled data. A small amount of labeled data. Right? Of course, if we are able to get hold of more labeled data, that will obviously improve the result. Thank you. This is all I had for today's lecture.